Hi, I'm Dr. Kate Gifford from Myopia Profile, and I'm here to talk to you about five key studies on Essilor Stellus lenses in under 10 minutes. I was initially going to call it five key studies in five minutes, but I've got so much interesting stuff to talk to you about it, I thought I'd avoid false advertising. And so we're going to talk about these five key studies in under 10 minutes. Let's get started. We're going to talk about the latest data on three year, four year, and five year efficacy of the Essilor Stellus lens. We're going to talk about eye growth patterns and how that relates to myopia control efficacy. And we're going to talk about data on visual functions with the Essilor Stellus lens. The first key paper is three year efficacy data. Now this was a one year extension of the original two year randomized control trial where children wore either highly aspherical lenslet spectacles slightly aspherical lenslet spectacles or single vision. And the highly aspherical lenslet design, which is Essilor Stellus, was found to be most effective. In this one year extension of that original randomized control trial, we had a variety of groups, which you can see on the slide here. So the HAL1 group were the children wearing highly aspherical lenslet spectacles, which is Essilor Stellus, for two years, and they continued for a third year. There was also the HAL2 and HAL3 group who were switched alternately from the slightly aspherical lenslets to HAL or single vision, who were the control group in the original randomized control trial, also switched to HAL. And then a new single vision lens group was recruited to match the group of wearers who had gone from single vision to HAL. There was some impact of COVID on this study in the second and the third year. So this recruitment of a new single vision lens group helped to ensure the most robust possible comparisons of efficacy for these groups. This is what was found in the third year. Essentially, if the children had been wearing the HAL, the Essilor Stellus lenses for three years, which is the HAL1 group, or one year, which is the HAL2 and HAL3 group, in the third year, the progression was similar. And that shows that starting later still had an effect but starting earlier had the greatest overall effect. As you can see those green lines there, the top of the chart on the left-hand side is change in spherical equivalent refraction, and the bottom is change in axial length. You can see how overall those green lines are lower because those children had been wearing the highly spherical lens spectacles for the entire three years. But in the third year, they all got an equivalent effect, regardless of what they had been wearing previously. And this tells us that while starting early gives the best overall results, as we can see from the charts, starting later in that third year works as well. The second key study illuminated four-year data. Now, of the children who completed the three-year study and then proceeded to four-year follow-up, there was 43, their mean age by this time was 13.7 years. Considering that all the treatment groups in the three-year study were wearing highly aspherical lenslet spectacles, which is Essilor Stellus, a single vision lens wearing model was employed instead to understand the efficacy. Now the single vision lens wearing model was a calculated model which had been reported in research based on the progression of the control group in the first two-year study and then extrapolated based on what we understand from typical myopia progression over time. So in these age matched single vision lens models, we could see that of all of the children who wore highly aspherical lenslets moving into this four year data, their refraction changes were around half of the single vision lens model. Their axial length changes were a little bit less than half of the single vision lens model. And the total four year efficacy of highly aspherical lenslet spec spectacles, again, we can see, led to about half of the rate of refractive and axial length progression. So overall, this represented a 54% reduction in refraction and a 52% reduction in axial length progression when highly aspherical lenslets were worn over four years. Our third key study advanced further to provide us with information on five-year data. So of the children who continued from the four-year study to the five-year study, we had 43 children again, and now their average age is 14.7 years. Again, we can see these very robust results for efficacy using this single vision lens model, which was used in the four-year data as well. We can see that the highly aspherical lenslet wearing children progressed 1.27 diopters 
over five years compared to over three diopters in the single vision lens model, giving an efficacy of 58%, 1.76 diopters less refractive progression. In terms of axial length changes, there was only 0.67 millimeters overall compared to 1.4 millimeters over five years in the single vision lens model. This gave an absolute efficacy of 0.73 millimeters less progression and 52% efficacy. So this shows us that the highly aspherical lenslet spectacle lenses slow myopia progression consistently over five years and were also effective in teens up to 18 years of age. Key study number four evaluated the eye growth patterns of myopic children wearing various spectacle lens designs versus non-myopic or emetropic children. And this is a really interesting and important analysis in understanding myopia control efficacy. It's important because you've heard me talk about figures like 52% and 58%, and those tell us how much eye growth or refractive progression is slowed down compared to a control group. But when we're thinking about eye growth, the goal might not be to actually stop eye growth. That might not be possible when we consider the fact that even children who are emetropic, remaining emetropic, are undergoing eye growth through the process of emetropization. So perhaps one of our new goals for myopia management and in understanding myopia control efficacy is seeing how many children wearing a myopia control treatment are actually slowing down to that rate of emetropic eye growth. And this may more accurately reveal the limits of myopia treatment. We can't expect to stop eye growth. We can slow it down. And if we slow it down to an age normal rate that's typically seen in, seen in children who are remaining emetropic, perhaps that's actually the ultimate goal of myopia management. Now, this is quite a technical paper which utilized data from the original randomized control trial of two years and compared the results of eye growth in children wearing highly aspherical lenslet, slightly aspherical lenslet and single vision spectacles to eye growth in non-myopic children. So normal eye growth was examined using 700 non-myopic school children who are aged seven to nine years from the WEPROM cohort study, which was undertaken in China. Slow, normal and fast eye growth was categorized. And this was using percentiles where slow was less than 25%, the 25th percentile. Normal was between the 25th and 75th percentile and fast was over the 75th percentile. Now, what you can see in that top box there was the upper limits of normal eye growth. So essentially the top of the 75th percentile for children aged seven to 10 years. And this modeling showed that the average amount of normal eye growth for a child remaining emetropic, seven to nine years of age in this WEPROM cohort was around 0.57 millimeters for children aged seven to 10. Now it's going to be a bigger number for younger children and as children get older, their eye growth tends to slow. So over two years, it was around 0.5 millimeters for 11 year olds, 0.39 millimeters for 12 year olds, and 0.24 millimeters for 13 year olds. Now the highly aspherical lenslet wearing children, wearing Essilor Stellis, they had a mean axial length change of 0.34 millimeters over two years. Look at that number compared to the non-myopic eye growth numbers in the box above that. In comparison, the slightly aspherical lenslet and single vision lens wearers had mean axial changes of 0.51 and 0.69 millimeters respectively. Now look at those in comparison to normal eye growth. And the modeling showed that around 90% of children who are wearing the HAL spectacle lenses full time, so at least 12 hours a day, seven days a week, had eye growth patterns similar or slower to the non-myopes. And this pattern was only found in 10% of single vision lens wearers. So our finding really from there is that if we're using this rate of emetropic eye growth or even call it physiological eye growth as a gauge, that 90% of children wearing Essilor Stellis full time are achieving this. Our fifth and final key study evaluated visual function with the Essilor Stellis lenses. This was testing of central and peripheral vision through the lens periphery, through the treatment zone of the lens. And this was undertaken in 16 visually normal adults who were tested monocularly. 
this testing was undertaken in high contrast, low luminance conditions, and when central or foveal vision was tested through the lens periphery, acuity was reduced by around one line, which is in line with previous findings. When peripheral visual acuity was tested through the lens periphery, the treatment zone though, there was no effect of the highly aspherical lenslet spectacles. Now, as promised, I have explained those five key papers to you in a whisker under 10 minutes, but I have two bonus papers for you, which help to illustrate this picture of minimal impact on visual function of the highly aspherical lenslet design, which is Essilor Stellist. This first study found that wearing highly aspherical lenslet design spectacles did not affect high contrast, high luminance acuity. That previous uh, study I told you about was low luminance acuity of high contrast. Reading speed, peripheral motion perception, and useful field of view were also unaffected. This second study was undertaken on children and found that accommodative lag and amplitude and neophoria was not affected, indicating these lenslets do not work as an orthoptic ad as we typically, typically think about an ad in spectacle lenses. After an adaptation period and when it was measured again at 12 months, high and low contrast acuity and stereo acuity were unaffected in children wearing Essilor Stellist compared to children wearing single vision. When we take our five key studies in sum, the three year, four year and five year efficacy data has shown us a consistent robust effect exceeding 50% control for both refractive and axial length changes, and also showed that starting children later works too, if they haven't had the opportunity to start where earlier. The new metric of emetropic eye growth found that 90% of children wearing Essilor Stellis met this metric. And this is a really important understanding for us to think about our goals for myopia control, as well as how we compare treatments into the future. And finally, on visual functions, there's a very clear picture from more than one paper, I showed you three there, that the visual impact of Essilor Stellis is minimal and that they really function for wearers similarly to single vision. An extremely important point that I want to make is that full-time wear matters if we're going to achieve these results similar to these fantastic results seen in the studies. And it was found in the original two-year randomized control trial that children who wore their Essilor Stellis lenses for at least 12 hours a day, seven days a week, had the best efficacy outcomes. If we're thinking about contact lens options, this has also been found in the MySight one-day study. The mean wearing time for children who also achieve very robust efficacy was around 13 hours a day, six and a half days a week. So we really need to think about these spectacles or contact lenses as a medicine. And if we're getting results which aren't in line with our expectations, Compliance is the first thing we should address. These are not just a pair of glasses, they are also a medicine, and it doesn't work if it's not taken. I'm going to finish by pointing towards some further reading where you can learn more about Essilor Stellist. And on myappearprofile.com and our associated social media profiles is a variety of education, courses, and resources to help you. An enormous part of my APA profile is our knowledge center. We have clinical articles and science articles. And if you want to learn more about Essilor Stellis specifically, the easiest way to find all of the information, everything we've ever written on Essilor Stellis is by going to our Myopia Control product compendium. When you click on the Myopia Control product compendium, you can pick from a variety of different treatment types. You can see spectacles outlined there. And from there, it'll be easy for you to find the page on Essilor Stellis lenses. On that page, you'll be able to find links to every article that we've ever published on Essilor Stellis, whether that be reviews of scientific papers or whether that be clinical articles where we're bringing a lot of the science together and answering specific cl clinical questions to help you put this into practice. I hope you've enjoyed learning these fascinating new facts on Essilor Stellis lenses and thank you so much for listening.